Hello, everybody, and welcome to Grey History, episode 78, Divided Heights. In the last two episodes, we've witnessed the battle for the sans culottes, competing with the enraged to lead the popular movement by late August the Albertists were on the verge of triumph. But even before these emerging radicals had vanquished the enraged, Hebert and his allies turned their fire on a new target. Fellow Jacobins. In this episode, the unity of the mountain will crumble. Ultimately, the coming contest will be brutal, bitter and deadly. But speaking of mountains, We are climbing one together, and I need your help to get to the summit. If you're enjoying Grey History, then there are a range of ways you can help ensure that there's more Grey History waiting for you tomorrow. From sharing with friends and family, to leaving reviews or one-off donations, any form of assistance would be immensely appreciated. Most importantly, if you're in a position to make a small donation when episodes are released, that would be fantastic. For the price of just a cup of coffee, you can help the revolution and enjoy tons of amazing perks while doing so. Now, it's with great pleasure that I get to welcome the newest revolutionaries. A warm welcome to the newest virtuous citizens, Boris, Leslie, Mahanda06, Layla, Heather, BDD and Ernest. Another warm welcome to the newest true revolutionaries, Andrew, Thorsten, Robert, Donald, and John. I hope you all enjoyed early access to this episode, and a special thank you to Christopher, Larry, and Naomi for increasing their pledge and becoming true revolutionaries. Of course, the people need champions, especially in a time of crisis. Thank you to the champions of the people, Cindy, George, William, Laura, Daniel, Monica, Joel, Adam, Tom, Eyal, Harold, David, Alistair, Carl, Jeff, Rita's, Hannah, Tyrone, Cameron, Britt, Dan, and Paul. Finally, one mountain range size thank you to the heroes of the revolution, the Pantheon of the Greats, Brian, Charles, Jeff, Orger, Kevin R, Scott, Howard, Gilberto, Ron, and Kevin S. Thank you to every member of the community for sponsoring the show, and thank you to everyone else helping the podcast in some other way. Anyway, that's enough from me, so let's get into it. The French Republic was no stranger to crisis. It was born in it, moulded by it, and yet, despite all its challenges, the revolution had continued to survive. But by the summer of 1793, that survival was increasingly in doubt. Besieged, divided, hungry and rudderless, the Republic's misfortunes seemed to multiply by the week. In the face of such unprecedented setbacks, it was only natural for people to attribute blame. For a time, the Girondins made an easy target. As defenders of the king and supporters of de Maurier, the false patriots were deemed responsible for all manners of ills. But after their purge on the 2nd of June, these ambitious schemers were absent. Missing from their seats in the convention, and expelled from their desks in ministries, the Republic's setbacks had continued unabated. Sure, some crises could be blamed on the Girondins, such as the Federalist revolts. But what about coalition victories, or the defeats in the Vendée? Were these the work of the Girondists? Or was someone else to blame? As the summer progressed, and the revolution spiralled, an increasing number of deputies found an alternative amongst their own. 
For three months, the National Convention had empowered a select few to spearhead the executive branch of government. Dubbed the Committee of Public Safety, this small group had been installed in April in the aftermath of de Maurier's failed coup. Dominated by Danton and his allies, the original committee had worked to revolutionise the Republic's administration. Given this Herculean task, the convention decided to assist. In order to maximise its efficiency, the deputies continued to support the committee's composition. Every month, its members required renewal, and every month, the convention kept its committee. However, by the first week of July, change was in the air. For three months, the committee had been empowered, and for three months, the revolution had suffered setbacks and defeats. True, many were beyond the committee's direct control, and some, such as the Federalist revolts, the committee had actively tried to prevent. But, with the war continuing to deteriorate, and purged Girondins no longer an easy scapegoat, the failures of the revolution were increasingly laid on the convention's principal committee. And it's here, in the second week of July, that the convention had to renew the body for a fourth time. For some deputies, re-election was simply unacceptable. If the definition of insanity is trying the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results, then renewing Danton's committee was evidently insane. Clearly, the current committee was proving ineffectual, and although it had been expanded in late May, the crises had continued nonetheless. Whether through exhaustion, incompetence, or worse, moderation, a growing chorus of voices found fault in the Committee of Public Safety. With the revolution dealt blow after blow, something had to be done. On the 8th of July, the Jacobin Club heard calls for a reorganisation of the revolution's most famous committee. For reference, the 8th of July was less than two weeks after the convention had endorsed the constitution on the 24th of June. It was concurrent with the first round of struggles between the enraged and the Jacobins, and it was a week before the assassination of Jean-Paul Marat on the 13th of July. At this meeting on the 8th, the Jacobin Club heard from various speakers who demanded change to the committee. One deputy stressed that he accused its members of nothing but understandable exhaustion and thus promoted the need to refresh the tired and overworked body. Others were less polite. Another deputy, Francois Chabot, openly let loose on his peers. For all but the most staunchest of Jacobins, Chabot listed crimes and incompetencies. A radical himself, Chabot made a point of denouncing the committee's supposed hostility to the current war minister, Bouchette. And yes, that's the same war minister known for his Albertist sympathies. In the days that followed, denunciations like Chabot's were not uncommon. Marat asked loudly, if the committee was asleep or if it refused to act. Even more moderate Jacobins, like Camille Demelard, rounded on the committee's perceived incompetence. As such, across the entirety of the mountain, many laid the nation's troubles at the feet of their fellow deputies. But if the committee was to be changed, there remained two unanswered questions. Firstly, what was to be done with the committee's most iconic personality? And secondly, was the committee worth keeping at all? If we start with the former, it's worth exploring the fading stature of the Mirabeau of the mob. Dominated by one man in particular, attacks against the committee were akin to attacks against George Danton. A giant of the revolution, the summer of 1793 was simply not Danton's season. Having been in the committee for months, the former lawyer was now exhausted. The demands had been monumental, 
and while the committee had performed well in some regards, the body was undeniably overwhelmed. Yet, far more important than Danton's increasing fatigue was his simultaneous decreasing prestige. The revolutionary's reputation was on the wane, and to understand why, we must note the impact of four critical factors. Factors which not only define his ouster from the Committee of Public Safety, but also the coming battle between Danton and Hebert. The first factor diminishing Danton's reputation was his relatively friendly relations with the Girondins. Now, the two were hardly best friends forever, but I said relatively friendly. Compared to the other prominent Jacobins, notably Robespierre, Marat, and subsequently Hebert, Danton and the Gironde were at least on talking terms. Remember, in the wake of the fall of the monarchy in August 1792, Danton was briefly installed as Justice Minister, in part because he was one of the few individuals who could negotiate with both sides. Over the course of the convention, relations swung wildly. Tempers flared due to the September massacres, but the military successes of late 1792 helped to diffuse some tensions. Months later, Danton was less staunch in his demands for Louis's execution, and compared to others, he hardly emphasised the supposed betrayal of the Girondins when they had sought a national referendum to determine the king's fate. But, in April 1793, the two camps crossed swords in the aftermath of de Maurier's failed coup. As discussed in episode 58, The Faction Menace, the Girondins even accused Danton of being complicit in de Maurier's conspiracy. In response, Danton swore against any reconciliation and attacked the cowards who had tried to spare the king. However, Danton was not true to his word. Despite these personal attacks, the Jacobin giant remained committed to keeping the peace. Nowhere is this more clearly seen than in the purging of the Girondins. As other mountaineers came to advocate a purge of the convention, Danton did the opposite. As a member of the committee, Danton actively worked against Parisian radicals as they made their first attempt to eject the Girondins on the 31st of May. This was back in episode 60, The Purge of the Girondins Part 2. Ultimately, the Girondins were purged two days later, on the 2nd of June. But the fact that Danton had sheltered the people's enemies had not gone unnoticed, nor had it been forgotten. For some Jacobins, especially for more radical Jacobins, such as the Albertists, Danton's continued willingness to treat with the Gironde was more than just a mistake. It was moderation, precisely the kind so dangerous at a time which required total war. The fact that the Girondins had subsequently fled to the departments to lead the Federalist rebellions merely discredited Danton further. Now, to be fair to Danton, the Federalist revolts was proof that he was correct that Paris could not simply arrest elected deputies and expect everything to be hunky-dory. But now was not the time for I told you so. In short, Danton's continued willingness to negotiate with the Girondins, to seek compromise with the other side, had brought him under considerable scrutiny from his fellow Jacobins. At a time when the Girondins remained at large and the Federalist menace grew by the day, the hour required severe and uncompromising measures. With worsening events discrediting both him personally and his policies, maintaining Danton in the Committee of Public Safety seemed to some to be utterly foolish. However, Danton's relations with the Gironde was not the only factor tarnishing his revolutionary image. As previously mentioned, back in April 1793, 
the Jacobin giant had been attacked by the Girondins for his relationship with General de Maurier. To recap, de Maurier, once the saviour of the Republic, had attempted a coup d'etat at the end of March. Defeated by the resurgent Austrians as they stormed back into Belgium, de Maurier led a brief effort to march against the convention. In the aftermath of his failure, the Republic's factions traded barbs over who was responsible for this most egregious betrayal. Compromised by their own connections to the general, the Girondins chose to highlight Danton's advocacy for de Maurier. Now, a full deep dive into these accusations is not required here, but the gist of it was as follows. In the weeks leading up to the coup, Danton had visited the front lines, and in particular, de Maurier. It was asserted that his exposure to the general should have presented the opportunity for Danton to realise that de Maurier was about to go rogue. The fact that Danton did not raise the alarm, and in fact continued to publicly support de Maurier, served as the grounds for allegations of conspiracy. Facing these denunciations as a co-conspirator, Danton managed to deflect the incriminating charges. But, although few Jacobins openly talked of treason, his reputation was nonetheless blemished. For Danton's political rivals, the question could now be asked. Was this incompetency, or was it treason? Moreover, This was the same question that could be asked regarding his former tolerance of the traitorous Girondin deputies. But before we move on, for members of the Grey History community, I suggest you re-listen to episode extra 58.2, Danton's Secrets, which explores these accusations in depth, as well as the conclusions of various historians. And if you're not part of the community, well, this is your opportunity to learn Danton's secrets and support the show while doing so. There's links in the show notes and on the website, and I would greatly appreciate your support of this revolutionary endeavour. Now, the fallout of Danton's support for de Maurier combined with the final two factors besmirching his revolutionary reputation. The third factor was suspicions of what detractors would call defeatism. Eventually, Danton will be famous for his advocacy for moderating the revolution, but already in mid-1793, the influential Jacobin was trying to minimise the war of the First Coalition. Acting outside its mandate from the convention, Danton's committee worked with the Girondin Foreign Minister Le Bras to uncover possibilities for peace. This being the same Le Bras who was so involved with de Maurier's plans for Belgium and the Netherlands. Interestingly, efforts with Great Britain went nowhere. But Prussia was another matter entirely. As discussed during our focus on Toulon, the Prussians were fixated on Poland, not France. Knowing full well which strings to pull, it appeared that peace might be possible at the cost of accepting the recent second partition of Poland. Danton's removal from the committee cut short preliminary discussions, but peace with Prussia is a fascinating hypothetical. As an aside, Prussia will be the first great power to conclude a peace with France, but that won't be until early 1795 rather than mid-1793. However, in addition to negotiating with the enemy, Danton's committee also oversaw efforts to ally with other European nations. Sweden was the most notable example, but envoys were sent to kingdoms and republics alike. Now again, these efforts were also largely fruitless, but that's beside the point. What matters is that while some of these negotiations were secret, not all were. And for those that were secret, enough had become public knowledge to fuel scepticism of Danton's support for revolutionary war. 
for some Jacobins, especially the Abertists, this was a critical flaw. As previously discussed, the Abertists were famed for their commitment to total war. As such, you can imagine their reception to whispers of a peace party within the Committee of Public Safety and the Foreign Ministry. Remember, some prominent Abertists were themselves foreign exiles, and their only hope was the armed liberation of their homeland. Furthermore, other Abertists were prominent members of the War Ministry, a ministry which would soon wane in importance if peace became the order of the day. For now, denunciations remained private, but ultra-radical hostility towards Danton's perceived defeatism was certainly on the rise. Finally, one cannot talk about Danton without discussing corruption and pleasure. For both defenders and detractors, Danton's love of life's delights is a defining feature of his legacy. Already, rumours swelled that he was benefiting from public office and was distracted at a time of national crisis. For a revolution characterised by the pursuit of virtuous behaviour, such gossip was particularly damaging. The charges were varied, as Danton's detractors spurred greater discontent by questioning his revolutionary credentials. Some clubbists complained of his lax attendance at the Jacobin Club. Others spoke of a deputy engrossed in vice and leisure. Tongues wagged as to how Danton's new wife had weakened his resolve to fight. And of course, there was always the question if de Maurier had bought Danton's loyalty. If so, what was the price? Now, how much of this was exaggeration and how much of it was true is both impossible to know and likely influenced by one's personal views. A divisive figure with no shortage of enemies, it's important to take all of this with a hefty bag of salt. After all, it's no coincidence that many contemporaries who would later accuse Danton of various misdeeds also had a vested interest in reducing his stature. So, thanks to his disposition towards Girondin federalists, traitorous generals, moderate policies and less than virtuous distractions, Danton's reputation was well and truly on the wane. But was he politically dead? No, far from it. And that's what made his position on the Committee of Public Safety all the more tricky. Yes, Danton was vulnerable, yet he was still a revolutionary giant. It would take a brave soul to try to force him from the committee. However, as various Jacobins lined up to push for change in the committee, the issue of Danton's future was just one problem to solve. Another issue lay in what to do with the committee itself. If the definition of insanity was trying the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results, the question could be asked, why not just get rid of the committee? Perhaps the issue was not repeatedly electing the same members, but rather repeatedly believing that the committee was the solution to the problem. Furthermore, there were other options available. For example, one could keep the Committee of Public Safety, but monitor its actions through a new committee tasked with oversight. As the Committee of Public Safety was already supervising the ministers, this new committee would supervise the supervisors. As messy as this sounds, this was one proposal that at least got some traction in the summer of 1793. Yet, as alluded to moments ago, another option was outright abolition. At the start of July, when these debates were ongoing, the convention had adopted the new constitution of 1793. Sure, the ratification of the document was now an ongoing process, but it was conceivable that the constitution could be enforced within a matter of weeks. The Constitution of 1793 
had no reference to a committee of public safety and instead saw the executive branch of government headed by an executive council. So, one alternative would be to just bin the Committee of Public Safety and implement, at least partially, the new constitution. As the summer progressed, this is exactly what leading Albertists would come to champion. So, in addition to the question of what to do about Danton, there was another question, what to do with the Committee of Public Safety. Critically, one man had the answers. Well, he had the answers that the Jacobins would eventually adopt. In response to escalating criticisms of both Danton and the committee, Robespierre intervened. Although neither a close ally of Danton nor a current member of the committee, Robespierre defended both. An expert in backhanded compliments, Robespierre sheltered Danton with criticism. In response to accusations of incompetence, Robespierre acknowledged the committee's flaws, repeatedly declaring that it had its faults. At a time when Danton and the committee were synonymous, this was a public rebuke. But that rebuke empowered his defence. Proclaiming that the nation required its services, Robespierre made it clear that the Jacobins should invest their confidence in the Committee of Public Safety. Although not nominating Danton for re-election, the influential deputy was doing his best to ensure the committee's survival. Why? Well, what exactly prompted Robespierre to champion the committee is a controversial matter. For some scholars, the Jacobin leader is merely protecting the institution which will facilitate his eventual dictatorship. However, I believe that a more objective observation is as follows. Put plainly, Robespierre, like Danton, genuinely believed that a central and powerful committee was key to saving the revolutionary project. Remember, The committee had originally been created in April 1793 to strengthen the effectiveness of government at a time of national crises. Three months later, and the state was in even greater danger. As such, both Danton and Robespierre would agree with historian Adolf Thiers' perspective that to attack the committee now was to destroy the necessary centre of all the authorities to weaken the energy of the government, and to compromise the republic. Consequently, Robespierre may have had his grievances with Danton, but the nation's existential threats required a united Jacobin club, which controlled an empowered Committee of Public Safety. So, the Committee of Public Safety would remain, and in the months that followed, both Danton and Robespierre would work together to ensure its continued existence and empowerment. However, Danton's presence on the committee was untenable. Ultimately, Danton did not seriously recontest election. Perhaps he was exhausted, perhaps he was disinterested, perhaps he appreciated more than most that the committee, at this moment, was akin to a poisoned chalice. Whatever the case, Danton's quiet departure must have come as a relief. The Jacobins had avoided a brutal intra-party struggle. Or so they thought. Yet, before we move on to the eruption of all-out war within the Jacobins, it is worth noting this reconfigured Committee of Public Safety. If the previous composition is occasionally called Danton's Committee, The committee of July 1793 is more akin to a transitional committee, one which would continue to change in August and September. Eventually, we'll unpack this so-called 12 who ruled at a later date. But for now, it's worth noting that seven of the eventual 12 committee members were elected on the 10th of July. By the end of the month, Robespierre was also elected with the committee requiring a well-connected and well-respected Jacobin 
to fill the void left by Danton. Again, we will cover the 12 who ruled properly once the committee reaches its final composition. Until then, it is worth noting that by the start of August 1793, two-thirds of the historic Committee of Public Safety had already taken their seats. So, on the 10th of July, the Committee of Public Safety was refreshed. Jacobins made up the majority of the committee, and it would be reasonable to guess that the club's tensions of prior weeks would now dissipate. However, revolutions have a tendency of being unreasonable, and just three days later, Marat was dead. As previously discussed, the sudden assassination of the friend of the people scrambled the politics of the capital. Fear and suspicion reigned supreme, and calls for radical measures echoed in both the clubs and the sections. It's here, in the aftermath of Marat's downfall, that we can pick up on the developments of the last three episodes. With the race to replace Marat suddenly underway, the tussle between the enraged and the Jacobins soon inflamed tensions within the Jacobin club itself. In particular, as Hébert sought to outmaneuver the enraged, he used his newspaper, Le Père Duchesne, to adopt increasingly radical positions. In some cases, this meant the popular program which underpinned the social and economic agenda of the ultra-radical movement. Price controls, forced requisitions, curtailments of economic freedoms. But having publicly rejected some of these measures just weeks before, Hébert needed to further demonstrate his ultra-revolutionary credentials. To do this, he attempted to outdo the radicalism of the competition. Unlike Jacques Roux and other enraged activists, Hébert was astute enough to support the Montagnier-controlled convention and its new constitution. Instead, Hébert focused his wrath on just a subset of deputies, the moderates. By attacking the independent deputies of the plain and the two-faced reactionaries within the mountain, Hébert could keep on side many of the more radical Jacobins who had been incensed by the indiscriminate denunciations of the enraged. Consequently, just as we see a battle between the enraged and the Jacobins, we also see an emerging struggle within the Jacobins themselves. The new campaign against Danton and his moderate allies began just a week after Marat's death. As various revolutionaries attempted to claim the fallen's legacy, Hébert spoke at the Radical Cordelet Club, once Danton's stomping ground, but increasingly the home of the radical Hébertists. In a speech laden with references to Marat, Hébert commenced a blistering assault on General Custerne the commander of the Army of the North, since de Maurier's treason. With French forces suffering numerous defeats since the Austro-Prussian counterattack of March 1793, the Republic was on the precipice of losing the Siege of Mines. This would be a major setback, surrendering both tens of thousands of troops and a critical stronghold in the Rhineland. But, While Hébert's assault against Custin was genuine, the attacks were a combination of both policy and politics. From the perspective of policy, the Hébertists, in their quest for total war, sincerely believed that aristocratic officers were betraying the Republic. Literally claiming that the nobles were murdering us, Hébert sought the dismissal of not just Custin, but all aristocrats in senior military positions. However, in demanding war against the aristocrats, these denunciations were also a public attack against Danton. Throwing subtlety to the wind, Hébert explicitly claimed that Danton had plunged the knife into our breasts through his earlier defence of the treasonous de Maurier. Furthermore, Danton's committee had left Custin in command, 
and with Danton still defending the general, was the Jacobin leader not protecting treason once again. Alongside this blistering speech on the 21st of July were other assaults from Hubert's allies. Recommencing the steady stream of grumbles which accompanied the campaign to push Danton from the Committee of Public Safety, those associated with the prominent Jacobin were soon openly accused of moderation. At a time when the moderate Girondins and the moderate Fillons were encouraging civil war in the departments, the accusation of insufficient patriotism and revolutionary fervour was dangerous, perhaps even deadly. Ironically, those accused of moderation were often anything but. Yet, as the weeks passed, the rising accusations became increasingly bitter and public. Take, for example, the denunciations made by François-Nicolas Vincennes. A committed Albertist, Vincennes was the Secretary General of the War Ministry, a perfect example of Albertists commanding senior positions within that ministry declaring that he would never be deceived by Danton's noisy words, Vincennes pursued the giant for his earlier actions in the Committee of Public Safety. Unsurprisingly, all of this agitation soon came to a head. On the 5th of August, Danton was denounced alongside the naval minister, Alberad, for promoting a man to oversee the reorganisation of the army at Toulon. Given that Toulon was now in revolt against Paris, the actions, or more accurately, inactions, of both this appointee and the minister were threatening to embroil Danton even further. Now, to be clear, Toulon was still conducting its Federalist revolt. It would not ally with the British for another few weeks, at the end of August. But these public allegations against Danton were damning nonetheless, for it supplied his vocal opponents with accusations of both incompetence and corruption. So considerable were the charges aired at the Jacobins that Robespierre intervened. Rushing to the club's tribune, the incorruptible once more used his reputation to defend a man accused of considerable corruption. Nevertheless, Robespierre's defence was fierce. Referring to the current war minister, Bouchette, and the former war minister, Pache, who was now the mayor of Paris, Robespierre used allegations against prominent Albertists to shield the embattled Danton. Robespierre proclaimed, I propose that this farce should cease and the sitting begin. Dalbarad is accused. I know nothing of him but by public report, which proclaims him a patriot minister. But what is he charged with here? An error? And what man is exempt from making error? The choice that he has made has not answered the general expectation. Bouchette and Pache have also made faulty selections, and yet they are two genuine Republicans, two sincere friends of the country. A man is in place. That is enough. He has culminated. Ah, when shall we cease to believe all the absurd or perfidious tales that pour in upon us from all quarters? I have perceived that to this rather general denunciation of the minister has been appended a particular denunciation against Danton. And is it of him that people want you to make suspicious? But if instead of discouraging patriots from seeking with such care after crimes, where scarcely a slight error exists, you were to take a little pains to facilitate their operations, to render their path clearer and less thorny. That would be more honourable, and the country would benefit by it. Bouchette has been denounced, Pache has been denounced, for it is decreed that the best patriots should be denounced. It is time to put an end to these ridiculous and afflicting scenes. I should rejoice if the society of Jacobins would confine themselves to a series of matters which they could discuss with advantage, and if they would check 
the great number of those which excite agitation in their bosom, and which are, for the most part, equally futile and dangerous. Denouncing the agitation which sought to discredit Danton, Robespierre demanded that this farce should cease. Sheltering his colleague from members of their own society, Robespierre's defence was successful. In fact, it was more. This marked, for a period of time, a renewed collaboration between the two Jacobin leaders. As the summer progressed, both Danton and Robespierre worked together to contain the rising influence of the Albertists. Perhaps more notably, in mid-August, the two men united to actively impede the ambitions of Abair himself. By then, the position of the interior minister, Gorin, was untenable, and the perceived moderate had to be replaced. Critically, Aubert used his position in the clubs and the commune to make a play for the post. Had he been successful, the implications would have been humongous. The Albertists already dominated both the war ministry and the Paris Commune. Imagine the addition of the interior ministry to the ultra-radical movement. For the Montagnards of the Convention, this was a cause for alarm, especially as the Albertists were succeeding in supplanting the enraged as the popular champions of the saint culotte movement. Threatened by a new generation of radical Jacobin leaders, the old guard manoeuvred to thwart a bear's ambitions. Thus, despite their considerable differences, in the summer of 1793, Danton and Robespierre continued to assist each other to pursue common aims. But his denial of the interior ministry was hardly a defeat, and a bear soon struck back. What followed was the infamous issue 275 of Le Pierre Duchesne. Writing as the patriotic saint culotte figure, Father Duchesne, Abert's assault was unrelenting. Reflecting the clever nature of his writings, this eight page issue contains countless themes already discussed. At first, Abert alluded to the soap riots which had gripped Paris weeks before. Now, these were the same riots which Abert had initially condemned, yet that is a detail he conveniently forgets. Playing on saint Culotte's suspicions that soap and other necessities were being hoarded to stifle the revolution, Hebert commenced his attack by accusing the people's enemies of washing the record of General Custin. Warning that such schemers and rogues had betrayed the people, Father Duchesne pivots and once again embraces the legacy of Marat. In Hebert's paper, the fictional saint Culotte figure claims to be speaking to and repeating the words of Marat's ghost. What follows is not just a rebuke of those defending aristocratic officers, but a targeted denunciation of Danton and Jacobin moderates. Although he doesn't mention Danton by name, the recipient is clear. In the quote that follows, I want you to note three specific attacks. Firstly, false patriotism. Secondly, the defence of traitors. And finally, corruption. All three are specific rebukes of Danton, even if he isn't mentioned directly. Here are the words of Marat's ghost, talking to a bear's saint culotte figure, Father Duchesne. Ah, if only my voice could still be heard, if my ashes could be revived, what terrible blows I would deal to certain individuals covered with the mask of patriotism. I would go to the convention with a dagger in my hand, as I told you on the eve of my death. Placed on the summit of the holy mountain, I would hurl thunderbolts at the false patriots. Montagnards, there are traitors among you. I would write, there are, have no doubt about it. You have crushed the toads of the plain. Snakes have crept up the mountain. The most deadly poisons live alongside the health-giving plants. 
I warn you, those of you who love liberty and equality, those of you who believe only in the Republic, one and indivisible, you are being led by the nose without you suspecting it. New statesmen have replaced those whom I pulverized. You, who seek only the happiness of the people, who have hands as clean as when you entered this convention, beware of these chatterboxes who, for three or four outbursts at different times, feel they have earned a reputation for patriotism thanks to their large lungs, and who remained silent when the Sankulots were in the greatest danger. I repeat, beware of those who claim to have more wit, talent and politics than you. What good have they done for the Republic? All these big talkers, all these endless reasoners. Did they prevent de Maurier from handing France over to our enemies? Did they drive out the Brissoans? No. When the people raised their clubs to exterminate the statesmen on the 31st of May, they showed themselves to be the most cowardly, the most contemptible of intriguers by turning their coats to the sans-culottes to side with the Federalists. In spite of them, the people saved themselves. In spite of them, the people have a constitution. Brave mountaineers, do not tolerate in your place those who arrived at the convention as true sans-culottes and who now have magnificent carriages, lands and castles which they hope to soon erect into baronies and duchies when the counter-revolution which they are brewing has been made. For those curious, that little tirade was just a quarter of the blistering assault unleashed by a bear. Unrelenting in his denunciations, this public crusade was almost apocalyptic. False patriots, rogues, schemers, moderates, the insults came thick and fast. Weeks earlier, the enraged had infuriated the mountain by labelling the convention the friends of bankers and monopolists. Now, fellow Jacobins were accusing Montagnard deputies of profiteering from counter-revolution. But, if you think that this assault against the serpents which infested the mountain was just against Danton and the perceived moderates, think again. In addition to unleashing a public battle between the extremities of the Jacobin club, he also commenced a struggle with the club's most iconic and influential member, Maximilien Robespierre. To understand how and why, we need to return to the Constitution of 1793. Let's rewind the clock two months. Back on the 25th of June, the enraged activist Jacques Roux stood before the convention and condemned it for its failings. The day prior, on the 24th of June, the body had adopted the new constitution, a document Roux and others thought woefully insufficient. In the struggle that followed, the ultra-radical enraged denounced the Jacobins, and some even called for another insurrection. Critically, the ultra-radical Albertists took a different approach. Originally rejecting much of the enraged social and economic program, they had also repudiated their political opposition to the new constitution. Instead, the Albertists who were themselves Jacobins, decided to tow the club's line and defend the fabled settlement. This was a crucial difference between the two ultra-radical groups. However, having defended the constitution, having told the people to wait for its benefits, by the end of August, a bear was done waiting. In fact, now was the time to seize an opportunity. It's here, in late August, that a bear broke with the Jacobins in the most unusual of ways. 
In the same inflammatory issue, Aber not only attacked Danton for his false patriotism, but he also attacked Robespierre, at least indirectly. Specifically, Aber attacked the convention's committees, and thus the Committee of Public Safety. Warning of tyranny and despotism, Aber compared the rule of the committees to the reign of kings. Consequently, he demanded the immediate implementation of the new constitution, seeking the return of regular government and critically the separation of powers between the legislative and executive branches. Here are aspects of his paper. Once again, this is allegedly the ghost of Marat, speaking to Abert's fictional Saint-Culotte figure, Father Duchesne. Mountaineers, as long as the committees usurp all the powers, we will never have a government, or we will have a detestable one. Why have kings done so much harm on earth? It is that nothing opposed their will, any more than that of your committees. The constitution, accepted by the people, wants everyone to do his job, and nothing more. That those who are destined to make laws make them good, and that those who must execute them, execute them. We will never have liberty. Our constitution will only be an illusion, as long as ministers are only messenger boys, at the orders of the last sweepers of the convention. He later continues, To save the republic, we must promptly organise the government as the constitution requires. Then, subsistence will become abundant, because the ministers will be responsible and will fear for their heads. Freedom is ruined when all powers are entrusted to inviolable men. To save the Republic, France must organise the government as the Constitution requires. But, what exactly did that mean? And how did it benefit a bear? Although personally rebuffed from leading the interior ministry, Abert's sympathisers still dominated the war ministry. With control over the Paris Commune, and increasingly the radical Saint-Culottes of Paris, Abert was making a simple bet. He and his allies could wield enormous influence, if only they were given the chance. Standing in their way, was the rule of the committees. More specifically, the Committee of Public Safety. Back in April, the committee had been created to oversee the ministers and streamline the administration of the government. Naturally, this included the supervision of the war ministry and the Albertist officials which now dominated its posts. So long as the committee remained in place, the nation's executive branch was subordinate to the convention. As such, for the Albertists to truly wield the power of the ministries, either those they already controlled or could control in the future, the Committee of Public Safety needed to be curtailed. This is why Albert was calling for the prompt organisation of government. If the Constitution of 1793 was enacted, even just partially, the Committee of Public Safety would have to be retired. This is because the Constitution would reimpose the separation of powers, and the legislature could no longer dictate the actions of the ministers. To paraphrase Abert's own words, deputies were destined to make laws, and thus they would be forced to focus on that task. Meanwhile, the new executive branch was destined to execute laws, and it would do so independently. In short, Abert was condemning the rule of the committees and their usurpation of power. And he was doing this because it was politically advantageous. Did he genuinely believe it was good policy? Perhaps, but we've already seen him shift his positions for his own personal benefit. If a bear could use his new position 
as a champion of the radical sans-culottes to secure the partial implementation of the constitution, then the Albertists within various ministries could act without the convention's oversight. In this scenario, the ultra-radicals would be free to use the full power of the war ministry to pursue their various aims. Combined with the influence of the Paris Commune and the insurrectionary potential of the restless sans-culottes, the Albertists could gradually dominate other ministries. In fact, they could even dominate the convention itself through intimidation and threats. So, this was a play for power, one that endangered not just Danton, but Robespierre, the Committee of Public Safety, and the National Convention more broadly. The threat posed by Hebert's manoeuvrings was not lost on Robespierre. Like Danton, he passionately believed in the necessity of the Committee of Public Safety, especially when the nation's crises were continuing to multiply. For months, Robespierre had defended and sought to empower the committee, and that was before he was even a member. By the end of August, he had been on the committee for only a month, and Hebert's calls for regular government were utterly intolerable. Thus, despite cries to enact the constitution, Robespierre resisted these demands. In fact, with Danton's assistance, the two worked feverishly to secure their policy of maintaining and strengthening the Committee of Public Safety. This was no easy task. With the enraged largely subdued, Hebert's new leadership of the ultra-revolutionary left lent considerable credibility to his cries for regular government. With direct democracy already popular amongst the sans-culottes, resisting calls to elect a new ministry proved incredibly difficult. Historian Albert Merti summarises the challenge facing Robespierre. The Pierre Duchesne no longer confined himself to attacking Danton and his friends, the traitors who sit with the mountain, as he called them. He wanted to restore the power of the ministers and make them and their agents independent of the assembly, the representatives on mission, and the committees. Hebert boldly demanded that the part of the constitution providing for the election of the ministers should at once be put in force. His defeat on August 20, when the convention had appointed Paré, Danton's former clerk, to the Ministry of the Interior, was still rankling. He would have his revenge, he thought, when the people chose their ministers. Robespierre had all the difficulty in the world in preventing the Jacobins from following Hebert and supporting his proposal that a fresh executive council should be chosen by popular vote. So, by September 1793, the Jacobins were increasingly a mess. Not only had factional struggles erupted between the radical and moderate cohorts, but so too had divisions between the revolution's key institutions. As commune and ministerial officials demanded the constitution and as Montagnard deputies resisted, the mountain was fracturing with speed. With the nation's crises continuing to intensify, Paris was once again a tinderbox, waiting for a match. Or, perhaps more accurately, waiting for the British fleet. For in the last days of August, the enemy seized Toulon. When news reached an already hungry and agitated Paris, well, I'm sure you can guess what happens next. Thank you for listening to episode 78, Divided Heights. In the next episode, we'll explore the last major uprising of the sans culottes. As always, thank you so much for your support of the show. If you have any questions or queries, please just send them in. And between now and the next episode, it would be fantastic if you could share the show with at least one other person. 
One final thank you to the newest members of the community, and a special shout out again to the heroes of the revolution, Brian, Charles, Jeff, Orga, Kevin R, Scott, Howard, Hilberto, Ron, and Kevin S. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. Stay safe and have a great day.